a quick history lesson really. Up until the 1970s, our art, like us as a people, were invisible. We were a pre-literate people, people who drew pictures on bark and rock, uh, who were represented in the flora fauna sections of museums, where we were frozen in time as people from a bygone era. Uh, we were seen as a Stone Age people and a people without culture and with the only value really for voyeurs of the exotic other in, the, uh, in international expos quite often, whose activities were actually confined mostly to hunting and fishing and um, we had spears but not spirituality, thus the, the signifier of the primitive. Yet today, some 30 years on, um, 30 or 40 years later, <coughs> Some 60% of Australian artists are Indigenous, and this is coming from a population of about around 3%, so, you know, fairly telling. And, and the industry has grown something like 400-fold uh, since 1980. That is, it's generated some 1 million in 1980 to 47 million in 1987 to well over 400 million now by 2000. And, of course, that's just an indicator. This is in the primary market and it's some um, similar kind of escalation in the secondary market. Now the answer to this may well, the reason why, may well be embodied in an observation about art by Oscar Wilde of all people, who said that the most successful art comes not from ambition but from necessity. Now today, our visibility in terms of Indigenous voice and agency, also which is also manifested in this uh, landmark publication of Artlink, Black on Black, um, edited by Aboriginal editors, written by black writers, about black artists, and for furthermore, it's by, for, and about those of us from the most colonised South who bore the brunt of the, of the invasion. So, you know, our necessity is rather obvious there. Uh, it was and is still, you know, the greatest um, um, need to continue the cultural survival. Cultural survival are the two words that motivate. So after decades of displacement and dispossession, we are representing ourselves and our culture. We are liberating ourselves from the old narratives which is a relatively new feature of the Australian cultural and political landscape. And furthermore, we speak with many voices now and we turn the gaze on ourselves and in some cases critical but always constructive to move forward. So how did we get to this point and what is it that necessity that drove us, as I said before, it's cultural survival. So buckle up, you know, we're going to go on a bit of a whistle-stop tour over the past 200 years. Um, here, again, um, for the unaware, rather than the ignorant, um, <laughs> here's an invasion. Um, at invasion, there were some 250 Aboriginal cultures in this co of the continent, of many countries. Uh, we may have all been dark-skinned, but we had many different languages, cultures and histories. And, of course, since colonisation and through intermarriage, we've fragmented even further, not less. Um, just as in Europe, there are many white people um, who may look similar, but who have many, also have many distinctive languages, cultures, and different, coming from different countries. So I make that comparison. Um, so when we speak of the West and the rest, we of the rest are as diverse as you of the West, um, and that's primary lesson number one. In this image by artist Gordon Bennett, we see the Captain Cook staking a claim and um, Aboriginal people being incarcerated by the bars of the flag. But our footsteps are imprinted on the land, and they're not erasable. They're just, they were just temporarily invisible. Since invasion 1788, we have been uh, dispossessed in different ways. We've uh, been moved to missions, um, to government reserves, or we've lived in the fringes of the white society. We've gone from this to this. We've gone from these, the Wilgers, to missions in nice square, tidy lines. Uh, from this to, in more recent times, to Gulpalil, uh, the, the uh, famous film star uh, on Bondi Beach, taken by Tracy Moff in the 1990s. So through irony and parody, uh, our artists appropriate the West's cultural icons and reoccupy the spaces once ta taken. 
Um, during the mission era, one could become Australian citizens if they denounced their Aboriginality and wore what was called a dog, pa dog tag. This is from 1944, it's by Sally Morgan. Now today, interestingly enough, and it's a story in itself, this is sort of reversed and one has to show papers to prove that we are Ab Aboriginal, uh, not as before. Despite all the um, attempts to erase our Aboriginality, like a tricky virus, has mutated under, undetected uh, under the surface actually for generations. And it, it burst forth, if you like, with a vengeance in the 1970s following the referendum of 1967, where we won the right to be counted as Australian citizens. So prior to the 1970s, of course, bark painting was synonymous with Aboriginal art and was believed, in fact, to be the only authentic form. These works were not, however, viewed as fine art or high art, but rather as objects of material culture. <coughs> Collecting was motivated by a salvage mentality, predicated on the belief that the culture was dying out. The reasons for not collecting bark paintings and similar artefacts as art until the 1980s was embedded in the nature of colonialisation. To accept these as images as fine art, the dominant culture would first have to acknowledge that the people who produced them had a culture equal to their own. That is, to share that rarefied category called high culture. So high art had, in fact, equaled high culture in Western terms. And this view would, in fact, be in total contradiction to the grand uh, narrative of progress that justified their actions. Um, so the political and cultural uh, activism in the 70s had to occur before the cultural production of the colonised could be admitted into that inner sanctum called of art, such as the freedom rights, which I have an image here in 1967, to setting up an Aboriginal tent embassy in front of Parliament House to um, protest about the lack of progress since that referendum uh, and particularly to demand for land rights and sovereignty. Now this embassy uh, uh, incited a lot of riots and protests over a period of time and as you can see you assemble lots of people, heaps of policemen getting lots of work to do uh, putting black fellas in jail and all the usual, and spite a lot of interesting artwork as well. So these are the pioneers in that sort of, uh, what would you call, frontier battle. Interestingly enough, the tent embassy still exists there in some form 38 years later, despite repeated efforts to move us on. In 19, a few years later, 1975, the, uh, another significant landmark was when um, there was a pivotal, when the Prime Minister at the time, Whitlam, handed back land to the Gurindji. And this was a pivotal national acknowledgement of our inextricable links to land after decades of strikes and protests. Now, the arts got its uh, first boost, major boost, really, in 1976 with the appointment of the first Aboriginal person to head up the Aboriginal Funding Board of Australia, of the Australia Council, which, of course, is our peak arts funding body. That means giving us funding, marketing and exhibition opportunities. Uh, this is a work by one of our pioneer uh, urban artists called Gordon Siren, who um, was a bit pissed off when he got put in jail for life uh, after um, confronting somebody for stealing his land. And it's called judgment by his peers. He was not being judged by his peers, so he's done how he's sort of reversed it and put the white fella in the witness box uh, and who is equally not being judged by his peers. So it started this nice sort of role reversal and exposing the contradictions. In uh, a more positive note, Lynn Onis was sort of concerned about role models, so he was sort of appropriating the Western heroes and uh, creating his own Captain Curry. In the 1980s, if in the 70s we fought on the streets, the 80s took the struggle into the institutions, taking us to a new level of self-determination. Like cultural terrorists, uh, we infiltrated the white centres of culture, as well as creating our own black centres. A new generation of Indigenous artists in the urbanised South, centred on Sydney, um, who felt ignored, dispossessed and abused, were very angry, but they were also very educated. 
So um, United, they set about reclaiming cultural ground after these decades of displacement to challenge, in fact, the, re the repressive structures that denied the cultural voice and really challenged the white view that real blacks had black skin and lived in the north, the sort of cultural apartheid referred to earlier. So in 1984, um, this is the staging of the first public city-based art exhibition was the first visible strike in this direction. It heralded the use of the term Koori, you hear so much now, to identify our regional difference to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters of the North. However, this was much more than an exhibition. It was in fact a rallying point. It was canned by the critics, of course. Uh, it was a rallying point for many advances around issues of visibility, Indigenous agency and identity. And out of that grew Bumali. Now, Bumali is an, um, an Aboriginal artists collective by a committed band of the artists who were in that previous show. Um, it provided a meeting place, support systems and exhibition opportunities, creating what was probably one of the most influential factors in the rapid ascendancy of city-based Koori art. And above all else, it was about Indigenous agency again and the right to find one's own Aboriginality in a very fluid and multiple, as a multiple identity, severing it from that anthropological domain as something singular and fixed and behind us. In 1988, while White Australia celebrated 200 years of occupation, the bicentennial year, we marked the occasion in the art arena with the installation of 200 hollow log coffins in the heart of the art establishment, the National Art Gallery of Australia. The Aboriginal Memorial was a memorial to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who died defending their own land in the absence of any other memorial to our fallen. One coffin per year since invasion. Meanwhile, we also had the opportunity to strike at the political heart of the nation with this mosaic by Michael Jagamara Nelson, the opening of the new Parliament House a profound statement about the coexistence of white law and black law. And it became, it showed actually the power of art as a political tool in a very national sense uh, as it became a site for political activism. So since the, the next decade, I'll slip you through quickly, is the 1990s. So by the 90s, Indigenous art had moved from the relative obscurity of the 1970s through the increasing visibility of the 80s to an international arena, from being curated to curating our own culture in white spaces. <coughs> now, we're on, the we're on the horse now. We're not just running alongside it. Some examples. Art Gallery of New South Wales uh, in 1993 established Australia's first dedicated space in a public art gallery to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art, which uh, I had the privilege to curate with an Aboriginal curator, Daphne Wallace. Described as the first post-colonial departure in the representation of Indigenous art by Professor Joan Kerr, we set about dismantling the cultural apartheid between the Aboriginal people of the North and us of the South by challenging divisive colonising definitions through use of multiple themes and non-chronological juxtapositions such as the placement of um, a work on canvas by uh, 1987 by young female city-based artist Judy Watson's entitled Inside the Rock, beside a bark painting by an actual man from the 1950s from the north called Nicholas, um, entitled Spirit Figure. So what it also does is shows the persistence of Aboriginality across time, place, gender and region and making the point that what unites us is stronger than what divides us. Internationally, we made great strides, um, symbolised by this jet, indigenised by an Aboriginal design company, Ballaringi, of which there are two or three, I'm not sure, where one can fly around the world in the world's largest modern artwork, and it's Aboriginal. We've been represented in the 90s by five artists at two separate Venice Biennales. This is the 1997 one with Emily, Yvonne Kumatri and um, Judy Watson. Our artists, mostly urban, were featured at the Havana Biennale, the first Johannesburg uh, Biennale in 95, Art Cologne from 93 onwards, and included in others like Beijing, Oxford, London, Paris, Buenos Aires, Kyoto, and so on and so on, New York, and um, too many to mention. One of the summary visual statements of the decade for me 
It was called um, All Stock Must Go. This raucously visible truck full of a mob of black fellas selling art from the back of a truck, which is an ex Australian expression, was presented by Campfire Collective and in a very splendid theatre of um, cultural transaction, right at the entrance of the Queensland Art Gallery, nice and messy. So it's all about self-determination. Uh, we're invited to exhibit inside, we chose to stay outside, although we had surveillance cameras that transmitted our activities inside. It was about cultural <coughs> loss and reclamation. Uh, the pivotal metaphor is the um, cattle truck uh, that once took our people like stock to market to depots of assimilation is now in our hands, repossessed by the dispossessed. Also, it references the, the economic, economic um, uh, realities for most Aboriginal artists who are not the chosen few to exhibit in galleries, but instead the majority of our artists sell for very little outside the white structure from literally the back of a truck. And it's a strong statement of self-representation which reversed the museological representation of the primitive habita uh, habitat that we saw earlier. Uh, in the new millennium was marked by a more sophisticated interrogation of colonial history, of counter-narratives and a new scale of internationalism and self-representation. On the national front there was an opening of the National Museum of Australia, opened by a Ab female Aboriginal director, 80% um, of the collection is Indigenous, there's a gallery of first Australians which occupies uh, one third of the exhibition spaces. We also have a dedicated um, separate space to the, for the Torres Strait Islanders, the only one I think in Australia certainly at the time, and um, and it was all done through with Indigenous management and consultation with communities. Big steps when you think about it from museum before. Now I'm just going to finish off basically with mentioning proper now, um, and this particular collective was motivated, they're from Queensland, to form a collective to resist one particularly pernicious legacy from the last century, which we've referred to a few times today, uh, which was that the Aboriginal people in Australia can be divided along a north-south axis of authenticity. It's very persistent. Only the ethnologically Ethnographically black people from the north produce culturally authentic works, therefore they get the support as more money can be made from them for the state, is one way of looking at it. While those from the south were culturally extinct and left to haunt the grey zones, culturally invisible and marginalised by the hegemony of the colonising state. So this band of uh, active activist artists, of which there are eight, very small group, who reached the limits of their tolerance and as a collective created a strategy for cultural survival, visibility through their agency. And they certainly did that and have done it in a very short time. I, I just uh, finish with the words of Mick Don Dodson when he was Commissioner for Social Justice in 1997. And he said, if you take the land, you take the ground of our culture, if you take the children, you take our future, and if you keep on taking, there will be nothing left to take. So artists of today are the cultural terrorists of a new order, and their art is the weapons for our future cultural survival. Thank you, Margot Neal.